Welcome. We are the Baja for Unitarian Universalists across Southern Arizona who know that we are stronger together. We gather on lands that were stolen from the Chiricahua Apache, the Pasquayaki, the Otham and Opata peoples who are the indigenous stewards of this land and our neighbors today. Whenever and wherever you are joining us, you are welcome to bring your whole self to this moment, to this time that you have set aside for worship, service, practice. I am here in my living room because we've just been through the neighborhood and today we are in our living rooms. I am here on Friday, late evening, with the knowledge and feelings and results that we have now. I have my tea, my blanket, my dog next to me. Because this week, this is grounding me in what is real. I encourage you, wherever you are, to ground yourself. Look around you. Listen, feel, notice. Turn left and turn right. Look up and down. Look right in front of you and right behind you. Ground yourself in the space that you occupy. Ground yourself in what is real around you. Because in this week, when our minds have been grappling with false narratives and projections of what could be, could become this, what you see and what you hear and what you feel, this is what is true and real and important. With this grounding in your reality, Hear these words from Rachel Kahn, written just around this time four years ago. It's entitled, What to Tell the Children. This is an excerpt. Tell them that this is a great awakening. Tell them that we humans have made some huge mistakes. And that's how we now find ourselves in this tenuous place. Teach them that hate is poison. Teach them that love is the remedy, that it is better to be readied for what comes next, even if the revelation is painful. Tell them that this is the paradigm shift, that the old is collapsing in on itself, that this death rattle is simply a temper tantrum the last gasp of a dying Goliath. Remind them of how they get wild when they are most tired and then pass out, that this is what it's about, that this is what is happening to a decrepit and ineffective empire. Tell them that everything is not okay and knowing that is okay. Tell them that love will win this war. But only if we remember that love is not just one unending cuddle puddle, but fierce as a mother bear protecting her cubs. Tell them that although this existence is damaged beyond repair, they must not despair. There is possibility and we will willingly and willfully open ourselves to new ways of being because the old way is not working, has never worked, and the world deserves better, and we are worth it. Tell them that they are not free while another suffers under enslavement. Teach them that we are all limbs on one body and we cannot chop off our own arm without deep suffering. Teach them humility, but also 
to relearn, to trust their intuition and beg their forgiveness for unintentionally misleading them previously. Tell them their gifts are useful. Tell them they are beautiful. Tell them they are the truth. With this grounding in reality, and these words that are for the child in each of us, come, let us worship together. One, two, three. We prepare for the future by Robin F. Gray. By the light of this chalice, we prepare for the future. By the light of this chalice, we prepare for the future. We prepare ourselves for the times of triumph and times of trial that may come. We prepare ourselves for times of triumph and times of trial that may come. We prepare ourselves to be present to one another with loving hearts even in the most difficult times. We prepare ourselves to be present to one another with loving hearts, even in the most difficult of times. We prepare ourselves to make the connections that will lift us out of isolation and prepare the path of justice and equality. We prepare ourselves to make connections that will lift us out of isolation and prepare us for the path of justice and equality. reading is called Give Voice to Morning by Reverend Linda Susan Ulrich. Give voice to sorrow and fear, the racking sobs at family betraying family, the shock at the chasm separating neighbors. What will you do in the days ahead, one asked. Hide in an attic, another replied, her eyes as wide and dark as Anne Frank's. Already, the assault on bodies have launched. Already, hatred has been emboldened. Already, graffiti has defaced stone walls. Already, harassment of the other has begun. When someone announces they're coming for you, 
Your, your worry doesn't spring from paranoia. It's based on the evidence of history. Give voice to denial and bargaining. The claustrophobic panic, desperate for a way out, clinging to any path that might alter the outcome. Where we live will be okay, one says. Who do you mean by we, another asks. You suppress the disorienting sense that you've fallen into the opening of a dystopian novel, calming yourself that everything must turn out okay, because the narrator is alive to recount the tale, ignoring the blankness of the next page. Give voice to anger and rage, that truth and kindness matter so little, that vitriol poisoned the community well. They will try to use your goodness against you, one said, and rely on your reasonableness to accept the unacceptable, another added. Retain your goodness and your reason, but always keep sight of the larger picture and the deeper values calling to you. Let your passion for justice burn, but not consume. Give voice to acceptance and hope. This is where we are. This is our new reality. For some, said one, the world we awoke to on November 9th was not much different than the one we'd been living in. Except, said another, that more people were woke to it. Already organizing is taking place. Already creativity and solidarity are sending out tendrils. Already resistance and resilience are storing themselves up. Already, signs of love are picking up speed. When someone announces they're coming for you, you find your people, you find your fearlessness, and you don't let go. Hi friends, Amir and I wanna to talk to our younger friends for just a minute. So if that's you, come on over. We, have, we wanna to talk to you for a little bit. So if your household is anything like our household, the last few days have been a little bit stressful. Maybe your adults are short-tempered. Maybe people don't have patience. Yeah, anybody? Us. <laughs> if it's not you, yay. We're so very happy. And probably sometime in the past or sometime in the future, there will be stress in your house or there will be some tension that happens. And I'm really curious what that feels like for you as one of the little people, one of the children in the house. For me, stress or tension feels, I feel it right here in my chest. It feels like a coiled up snake ready to bite people rah, at a moment's notice. And I don't have very much patience and and I don't have very much patience and I get irritable very quickly what about for you what does stress or tension feel like it's hard to say sometimes isn't it <laughs> Can I tell you what I see? Can I tell people what I see? Yeah, sometimes when Amira feels stressed, all she wants to do is lay on the sofa and cry. That's it, and that's how I know that she feels tense, and that's how she tries to get it out of her body. Sometimes what I'd like to do is just shake. Shake, shake it out, shake it out. Yeah. The reason why some of our adults are feeling so stressed right now is because we just had some voting and we know that as of the time that I'm recording this, we don't know what all the results are. But the one thing that we do know is that a whole lot of people voted for a whole lot of things that hurt people we love, that are going to make decisions that hurt actual people we love. And that's scary. And it's really, really sad because we don't want people to vote for things that hurt other people. And... I also know that no matter how afraid or upset or sad we are, we've been through stressful things before. We've done this before. And it's been hard, and we've gotten through it. 
I'm thinking a lot this week about this story about a person and a tiger. Have I told you this story yet? No. I need to. Okay, so here's the story. A person is walking down a trail and suddenly finds themselves being followed by a tiger. They notice the tiger and they start running. That's what I would do. Start running and running and running. And the tiger is getting closer and closer and closer. And they realize that they're getting to the end of the trail. And at the end of the trail is a cliff. You know what a cliff is where the a mountain ends and they're going to fall off. And so now they have this terrible choice between the cliff and the tiger. And they look down and they see on the ground, there's this tiny little vine, a little plant that's growing. And so they say, I'm going to take my chances. And they climb down this vine and they're holding on by this, this tiny little vine. And there's a tiger on one side and a deep drop on the other side. And you know what comes up? Little mice. Little mice come and they start chewing on the vine. So now the person has a tiger and a deep cliff and mice chewing on the vine that's holding them up. And the person looks over to the side and they see right here, beautiful red ripe strawberry. And they pick it and they eat it and it is delicious. So friends, we have these stories of survival. We have these stories of joy and we have stories of thriving. And there are stories in your family and your friends who have been through tough things and made it through. So ask, go find an adult who you love or you trust or you think just tells really good stories and ask them for their stories of survival and resilience. And they're out there. And know that we love you and we will be here and we will get through this together. When I am frightened, will you reassure me?
Can you recall a time that someone built a bond with you through a story? When you were invited to hear a personal experience that brought you nearer to the teller, closer in care and in giving and in love? Stories shared can be so powerful in relationship. And so perhaps you remember a time when you were very young, or perhaps you are fortunate and this happened just recently. Whenever, take a moment and remember that time. I recall a time my mother shared a story with me. It was night and it was cold and it was late and I couldn't sleep. <clears throat> Excuse me. The hall light kept on because I was afraid of the dark seemed dim and distant. I remember the feeling of my favorite pajamas, the buttons up the front and the collar at the top. And I remember feeling deeply troubled. I was concerned, even afraid of the feelings I was experiencing. And I remember the warmth of her hand as she listened, simply hearing me. I remember nodding and pausing when I had exhausted myself, and her face took on the expression of recalling the past and yet still being present with me. And then she told me her story, quietly and with certainty. She told me of a time when she had struggled with the same feelings that I was feeling. And I do not recall the details I don't remember who or what or how in her story. I do recall her assurance that I was not alone. Not by telling me you are not alone, but by joining me right where I was that night. Stories shared can empower relationship. And that many remembrances of these kinds of stories are from childhood makes sense. Children are attuned to emotion much more than facts and information. And this may be why children's stories are often fantasies, fables, and fairy tales, because they are about feelings that the fantastical stories evoke, and not about the surface. Of reality. Relationships, too, orient around our emotions and shared experiences, often more than they do concerning, concerning the who or what or when. Children in empowering stories, well, they intersect in the sharing of our emotions. Of course, adults can share in these stories, too, yet I wonder if when we do so, it is through our own inner child. Hmm. Regardless of age or inner or outer child, stories that empower our relationships are valuable to us today in these troubled days of fear and anger. And you might begin to share in these stories just by listening. Listening for the emotions being expressed listening for the truths being explored, listening for an opportunity to share in relationship. And then you might recall a time when you struggled with similar feelings and truths. And open, then, to the sensations that you experienced, what you saw and heard and touched or even tasted and smelled. Smell is such a powerful memory aid. Share the experience. Describe what you sensed. Invite another person into your story. Instead of, instead of telling the story the right way, focus on being true to your feelings, to the struggle, 
into the uncertainty. And finally, while we all love Aesop's fables, we are not living in a time ripe for moralizing. Simply be vulnerable. Share your experience open to relationship. Stories shared can be powerful in relationship. Stories shared can empower relationship. For the power we have in sharing relationship of listening, offering experiences and being vulnerable, it connects us, assures us that we are not alone. And it offers more caring, more giving, and more love. Sleep, my child, and peace attend you all through the night. I, who love you, shall be near you all through the night. This, my loving vigil keeping, all through the night. Are you needing to be cradled and held? I know we have been. Becoming a parent to this child, Joy, has taught me something about that. Joy teaches me that when we're tired and scared and overwhelmed and hungry, that when we need to weep, that what we ache for is someone to be near us and to keep vigil. Now, sometimes when she weeps, and especially when she weeps and I can't fix it, I share a tear with her. And sometimes when you weep, I know that you want me to hold you close and witness the tears without drawing away or recoiling at what I don't understand or what I cannot fix. And it's then that I say to her after both are weeping, we will try again tomorrow. Or sometimes my partner and I say to each other, Let's begin again tomorrow. We are both a people who need to weep and the people who need rest. We are a people who also need to keep vigil. We need both because after the long night, there is a more important Thing. There is a future that asks us to be active and engaged and committed. There is work that asks us that we cannot be stopped no matter what, that it needs our resources and our resourced selves, and that it cannot let us be distracted by what would do harm with our attention. So, <laughs> come, <laughs> come. The future asks us to. For the child in each of us, take rest, keep 
vigil. <laughs> Hold close and begin again. This past Tuesday night, I had trouble falling asleep. We were in the midst of an election that shows just how deeply divided we are as a country. And I was reading a book that celebrates the power of human connection to bring healing. James Maskell, in the book, The Community Cure, shows that in blue zones, where people live the longest in the world, a key component is the depth and breadth and richness of their human relationships. And when people are isolated, they suffer far worse consequences from chronic disease. Community is a superpower, but not just only for us as individuals, healing us in heart and body and mind, but also for the larger world. Peter Block, in his book, community, the structure of belonging, says that if we want to see change happen, we improve our education, uh, strengthen our healthcare system, it's more important not to look to experts, but to the strength of our social fabric. And he calls on us to be citizens, not in the sense that we belong here legally or we cast our vote, but that we take on a calling that sees our agency, that does not give up our power, but that reaches out and appreciates and uses and works with the gifts of others and acts to bring the gifts of those on the margin into the center. Community is a superpower. How can we nourish good, strong community in this divided country? That is far more important to me than who will be finally declared president. This past week, Riley, who is um, the technically the intern for UUCT and Borderlands, but shares her wisdom generously with all of Baja Four, gave a good definition. She says that when a group of people have met together often enough, belong enough to each other that they notice when someone doesn't show up they think should be there. That's a community. And a healthy community goes and looks for those who don't show up to find out why. Many of us have been blessed by a flawed institution that provides community. Churches offer a wealth of intergenerational connection 
that we don't often find in this country. And people often complain that churches are social clubs. I think that's only half a problem. The social part is a treasure, a wealth to be nurtured and enjoyed. It's when we become a club that a church has a problem. Now, during this time of pandemic, we have noticed when someone hasn't shown up to Zoom and we often reach out in our churches to call to find out why not. But have we asked a broader question? We often wonder why we have so much to offer as a liberal thinking religion. Why aren't there more younger people here, people who are different from us, from different backgrounds? Have we ever looked to ask why they aren't here? I value the work of Alex Capitan, who spoke to us two weeks ago and pointed out that 72% of trans you use do not feel fully included by their churches. And that Alex, who grew up in the UU, has yet to find a home congregation. Do we listen? Do we go to the margins to invite in to the center? These gifts, it will change us. It is morally right. And it will enrich the communities we seek to build. Our superpower will be so much stronger if our community is healthier, we've begun to ask, what do we need to know? And when we're there, that we claim agency, we promise to listen more than we talk, to believe the experiences that we are honored to hear. Can we nurture our communities to be the superpowers they need to be in the world? We must do so. We must listen. We must find those gifts and understand where we have not been welcoming. For that is the only way to change ourselves and the world. We are blessed by every sunset. Every sunset makes us whole with its riches and its beauty. Every sunset feeds our soul, and we are called as keepers of the earth. We are called speak its sacred worth for our children and our children's children we are called as keepers of the earth we are blessed by every desert every desert makes us whole And its beauty, every desert feeds our soul, and we are called as keepers of the earth. We are called to speak its sacred words for our children and our children. Oh.
for our children and our children's children we are called as keepers of the earth. At this moment, while I'm recording this, there is still a great deal that is unknown. And it's quite likely that even while you're watching, there's still a lot that is undecided and unclear. Sometimes being in uncertainty can be very uncomfortable. And something that I turn to as a source when I need to resource myself is remembering my values and remembering the community that I have shared values with. Our UU principles invite us to stay engaged and to stay connected to one another even when we don't know where we're going. And despite not knowing where we're going, I'm glad to be going with you. I want to share a quote that has carried me through many other times. It's actually from 1993, from a commencement speech that Cornell West gave at Wesleyan University. Last, but not least, there is a need for audacious hope. And it's not optimism. I'm in no way an optimist. I've been black in America for 39 years. No ground for optimism here, given the progress and regress, and three steps forward and four steps backward. Optimism is a notion that there's sufficient evidence that would allow us to infer that if we keep doing what we're doing, things will get better. I don't believe that. I'm a prisoner of hope. That's something else. Cutting against the grain, against the evidence, William James said it so well in that grand and masterful essay of his in 1879 called The Sentiment of Rationality, where he talked about faith being the courage to act when doubt is warranted. And that's what I'm talking about. No matter where each of us finds ourselves in this moment, no matter what is certain and what is uncertain, May we each stay connected to the sources that lead us to hope, even when it is very challenging to do so. This is the keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going on, keep going on song. This is a keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going on, keep going on song. This is a keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going on, keep going on song. I am Abigail, and this is Sean, and we're so glad that you turned this on and welcomed us into your home, and you are welcome into our home. We're in. Dayton, Ohio. Dayton, Ohio. We're in Sean's parents' house. <laughs> My parents' house. <laughs> Sean's parents' house. We were in Louisville when the hit, and we packed our three-year-old into a car. We drove kind of far. We drove here, and we've been so lucky and blessed to be safely here. And we thought we'd be here for like ten days, tops. What did we know? What did we know? What did, what did we, we know? Was? We thought we knew a lot. We this thought we knew going, a lot. Keep going, keep going, Woo! keep going on. Keep going on, song. This is a keep going, keep going, keep going on. Keep going on, song. This is a keep going, keep going, keep going on. Keep going. And we've been mostly healthy. We've been okay. Are you okay? 
Are you all right? Are you okay? Are you all right? Are you okay? I hope your body is whole tonight. And if your heart is breaking, I hope it's breaking open. And if your breath is shaking, I hope it's shaking through. And then I hope that you've watched a lot of really great television, like a lot of it. And I hope that you find a hand lotion that actually makes your skin feel better. And I hope that you have enough to eat. I hope you're getting enough sleep and I hope you have enough good company or enough good memory to last you a long time. I pray my rage is a fire that cleans my mind out and makes me ready to listen. I pray my pain is a river that flows to the ocean that connects my pain to yours. And I pray, I pray my happiness is like pollen that flies to you and pollinates your joy. Oh boy, oh boy, is that possible? I don't know. I don't know. We are making this up as we go. We have to make it up as we go. The keep going song, the keep going song. Oh, we're making it up. We're making it up as we go. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going on. Keep going on song. And I pray that when we meet again, that the world has changed the world that we are imagining now together and I pray that the world has become the world that we're planting inside of ourselves for each other and for our ancestors and for our kids Ooh, and we're gonna start we're gonna start this is a rough beginning that's all I've got is a rough beginning to all we're gonna start by singing some songs in this tiny space together. We're just gonna sing some songs for you and we hope that when you hear them, you will feel a little bit less alone and we will feel a little bit less alone in the work and in the hurt and we will be together tonight somehow, whenever this is, wherever this is. We will be together tonight. For the keep going, going, keep going, keep going, going, going on, keep going on song. This is a keep going, going, keep going, keep going, going on, keep going on song. This is a keep going, going, keep going, 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 going on, keep going on song. This is a keep going, going, keep going, going. Children to do that for us. <laughs> you gotta leave that on. You gotta leave that on for charity. <laughs> Just send him all of these. <laughs>